How can a guy 5'9 have an unfair advantage over these guys? I use the Gillette Atra razor. They don't. It's got the advantage of a pivoting head. Atra is better than twin blade razors that don't pivot. See? They don't always stay in my beard. But my Atra pivots to keep both blades on my beard longer. So I get a better shave. Close. Comfortable. Get the Gillette Atra and get the Atra advantage. Sometimes a little advantage goes a long way. Thanks for the house call, Matt. You should put these hands in a cast. It's dishwashing. What'll I do? Everything. And use palm olive liquid. You're softening in it. Mmm, like a lotion. Feels soft. Mild. More than mild. Palm olive suds really last. Palm olive is efficient. A whole sink full of hard-working suds lasts longer than my old brand. Madge, palm olive's great. Sure glad I know you. <laughs> Just another lucky break. Oh. <laughs> palm olive soft on hands. Washes more dishes. In honor of Ronald Reagan's visit to Canada, a special evening of entertainment. The Reagan Gala, Sunday at 8, 9 Atlantic, 9.30 in Newfoundland. One Canadian in marriage in three ends in divorce. Patrick Watson explores the branch of the law where emotions run highest. You can only accomplish miracles if the parties allow themselves to uh, work with you. It's exciting. I mean, you're, de you're dealing with people's emotions, uh, their blood, their guts. You're getting paid for it. Family Law on Lawyers, Sunday. Right now, stay with CBC Television for the day's top stories. Knowlton Nash brings you The National, next. This is CBC. World-class audio components from DJ Woofer at record-breaking prices. The unbeatable combination that makes for a winner. Joining the middle class is this Fisher system, featuring a 65 watt per channel amplifier with five band equalizer, quartz digital tuner, direct drive turntable, cassette deck with Dolby B and C, and matched three way speakers. This complete Fisher system at $799.95 is definitely a winner. From DJ Woofers, 340 Portage Avenue. Come to Robertson's Furniture in Selkirk for the latest in color television by Electrohome. If you're looking for the best color, styling, value, and features, take a look at Robertson's selection of Electrohome televisions. These strikingly elegant cabinet designs are very watchable, and Robertson's low prices include one-year factory service on your new Electrohome TV. Robertson's, Manitoba's showcase of values for Electrohome TVs and fine home furnishings. 374 Eveline Street in Selkirk. After 25 years of solving mysteries beneath the hood, Ace Auto Electric has mastered the electrical mechanical maze, the confusing carburetor, the grinding gears, the dead battery, the weird wiring, the awesome alternator, the worn water pump, the disturbed distributor. Bring us your mystery. We're Ace Auto Electric. Steve Bonio, a 24-hour special. It's been a long, hard road, both emotionally and physically, and there's many more miles to go. But Steve Bonio is as dedicated as he is tough. I guess maybe a lot of people don't have a goal. I guess they don't really know what they want to do. I know what I want to do, and I'm going to do what I want to do. You're stubborn. <laughs> the commitment and endurance of Steve Bonio. A personal profile, Monday, on 24 Hours, Manitoba's Finest Hour. Cityscapes profiles Winnipeg Monday at 7. Thursday, March 14th. Tonight, on The National, back from the Kremlin, Mulroney says Gorbachev's in full control. Kneeling to pray, it bothers the church, but not the Supreme Court. And on the journal, the Geneva talks, trading away the nuclear stockpile, American bid, Soviet gambit, the players sit down to resume a deadly game. The National, with Milton Nash. Good evening. There's a hostage taking in progress at the Kingston Penitentiary in Ontario. Four hostages are being held in the penitentiary's sick bay. One hostage, a woman, was released earlier tonight. So far, authorities say none of the remaining hostages has been hurt. Toad Adams reports. 
The hostage taking at Canada's oldest federal penitentiary began in mid-afternoon. Three inmates carrying homemade weapons took five nurses hostage in the prison's health care center. One was later released. Shortly after, prison officials made contact by telephone and negotiations to release the rest of the hostages began. They talked into the night, but officials would not say what the inmates are demanding. The inmates do have access to radio and TV, so at this point it would not be in our best interest to get into detail. Uh, it might affect the negotiations. There were no reports of trouble among the rest of the prison population, 400 of Canada's most dangerous criminals. Just recently, inmates here staged a week-long work stoppage in protest over things like food, exercise and visiting privileges. Officials won't say if today's hostage-taking is related to that protest. Claude Adams, CBC News, Kingston, Ontario. Brian Mulroney is back from Konstantin Chernyenko's funeral in Moscow. He flew back tonight after a private meeting at the Kremlin with the new Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. Mulroney says the meeting went well, but it appears he wasn't asked to play the role of honest broker between the Soviets and the Americans. We have two reports, the first from Jan Lazowski in Moscow. World leaders gathered here for the funeral have kept up a frantic pace for the past two days. Most of the activity has been around the Kremlin, where attention has been focused on the new man in charge. The meetings have all been behind closed doors. The world has yet to see Gorbachev at work. Prime Minister Mulroney met with him for 45 minutes. They talked about Soviet-Canadian relations, as well as issues like disarmament and easing of East-West tensions. Like all Western leaders who have met Gorbachev, Mulroney came away impressed. Uh, there's certainly openness. There is an understanding of the West uh, that uh, in some areas was not always uh, present in the past. And so I'm very hopeful. Uh, I think it's a long, tough road, a very difficult road, but that uh, uh, there seems to be uh, the willingness to, to begin the process in good faith. Later, just before going to his plane, Mulroney offered a slightly different assessment to Soviet Deputy Prime Minister Nikolai Ryakov. He's, he's, not, he's as good as the Russian hockey players. Он также умел, также хорош как русский хоккеист. I wish you every success. John Lazowski, CBC News, Moscow. As he arrived home from Moscow this evening, the Prime Minister continued to praise Gorbachev for what he described as his candor and his genuine concern for improving East-West relations. Before leaving from Moscow, Mulroney left the impression that he was open to playing the role of an intermediary between Gorbachev and President Reagan, whom he'll meet in Quebec City this weekend. But Mulroney now says he carries no special message from Gorbachev, although he will convey his I, uh, views of the Soviet leader to Reagan. But the substance of what he said uh, uh, certainly warrants reflection by me and my colleagues. And there, is, uh, there are impressions that I derive that um, I think uh, that I will, of course, in the arms and negotiation uh, section of my meeting with President Reagan, be raising with him, obviously. Mulroney also suggested that with Gorbachev in charge in Moscow, the prospects may have improved for the Soviet-American arms talks that resumed today in Geneva. But no one, he said, should be under any illusions. The process will be long and difficult. David Halton, CBC News, Ottawa. Opposition MP stopped the business of the House of Commons for more than 90 minutes today. They're angry at the government for deciding to sign the new North Warning Defense Agreement with the United States without debating it in the House first. Opposition MPs suspect the agreement may tie Canada to a proposal by the U.S. to research weapons in space. Mike Duffy reports on today's protest. The Commons Bells. Designed to summon MPs to votes, they've increasingly come to symbolize opposition on happiness with government. Today's 90-minute Commons delay occurred when opposition MPs couldn't get details of the North Warning Radar Agreement from the government. And those are surely questions we should know before the ink goes on the agreement. The agreement is to be signed in Quebec on March 18th. It will then be made public and it will be tabled in the House of Commons. Well, obviously, Mr. Speaker, to a, to a democratic parliamentary body, that is totally unacceptable. Concerned the new radar system might eventually become part of the American Star Wars program and angered by the government's refusal to give details now before the agreement is signed, the opposition first tried to have the Speaker order an emergency debate on the issue. 
When that failed, the, order, the opposition the went for the bells. We take the only move that we can, and I move that this House do now adjourn. Call in the members. Even with a huge majority, this present government cannot expect to, uh, to run the type of closed shop involving the future of this country without bringing matters before the House of Commons. This is the democratic chamber, this is the forum of the nation, this is the highest court in the land, and the members of the House are being denied their rights on behalf of Canadians to express an opinion before that treaty is signed by the Prime Minister and the President of the United States. Ninety minutes after the filibuster began, opposition MPs returned to the House, and the Commons got back to business. John Turner returned to his office, obviously pleased about having made his point. Mike Duffy, CBC News, Ottawa. External Affairs Minister Joe Clark has denied reports the government was asked to tighten security at the Turkish embassy a few days before it was attacked. A Turkish cabinet minister says his government made the request after it warned Canada of threats made against the embassy. A Pinkerton guard was killed after three Armenians seized the Turkish embassy Tuesday morning. Search and rescue teams are working off the coast of Newfoundland. They found parts of a helicopter that went down last night in a heavy storm, but they haven't found any sign of the six people who were on board. Catherine Wright reports. It was almost as foggy and rainy today as it was last night. Still, after hours of searching, a helicopter, a Coast Guard vessel, and supply boats did manage to find something. Roger Bartlett, uh, could you advise us of uh, what you've uh, located so far? Over. But so far, no bodies. It was a helicopter like this one, and it was traveling from this Petro-Canada oil rig, the Bowdrill One. The rig is moored just outside Argentia, waiting for the ice to clear offshore. The helicopter was on its way to St. John's, a 40-minute trip. Six men were on board. They took off just before 11 p.m. Shortly thereafter, our radio operator on the rig uh, uh, failed to uh, make communication uh, with the uh, helicopter. Residents in the nearby town of Fox Harbor say around the same time the helicopter went down, they were awakened from their sleep by a loud noise. The windows shook and it was loud, motors. Last me five, ten minutes to see it. Sounded like loud motors. Yeah. Loud motors. Weather permitting, the Coast Guard will search again tomorrow for bodies and for clues as to what might have caused the accident. Once the search has ended, Transport Canada will hold an investigation. Catherine Wright, CBC News, in Fox Harbor, near Argentia, Newfoundland. The Bank of Canada rate has dropped for the first time in seven weeks, but only by an eighth of a percentage point. The new bank rate is 11.69%. Analysts say the drop is too small to bring lower interest rates for mortgages or for consumer loans. They say the rate dropped because the Canadian dollar has been fairly stable for the last week, and the Bank of Canada did not make any moves to boost the value of the dollar. The British Columbia government will give business almost a billion dollars in tax breaks over the next three years. The breaks are business for business are in the budget the government put forward this afternoon. It's the third budget since the Bennett government brought in its controversial restraint program. The government says it's sticking with restraint, but it's also trying to stimulate the economy. The unemployment rate in BC is 15%. The Supreme Court has handed down its right to kneel decision. It was supposed to be a landmark Charter of Rights case involving the freedom to worship as you choose. But the court didn't even consider the charter. It simply ruled that no one should have been convicted in the first place for kneeling to take communion. Jim Sundstrom reports. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. In all, about 25 people, including children, are being refused Holy Communion because they insist on kneeling despite an order from their bishop to stand during communion. Three years ago, six of the group were convicted of disrupting a service in this Roman Catholic church by kneeling. They were sentenced to six months probation. Since then, they've had to go outside the parish to take communion. One of them, Roseanne Skogg Graham, is a lawyer, and she appealed the case all the way to the Supreme Court. Today, she won. The court ruled the six should not have been found guilty because quietly kneeling does not disrupt a church service. Should the priest and bishop continue to uh, deny us that right, then we have no other alternative then perhaps to take a civil action in, under the Canadian Charter of Rights and also to pursue the matter in the ecclesiastical court. The Supreme Court's decision is welcome news for the families involved. Now to know that the decision has come in our favor 
is certainly a, a great source of encouragement to us all. The bishop who issued the directive to stand during communion wants to read the decision before deciding what to do. And the families say they'll be back in church for Sunday Mass. They will kneel for communion, and they hope that now the priest will include them in the ritual. But he might not. Although they aren't guilty under criminal law, they're still defying their bishop by kneeling. Jim Sundstrom, CBC News, Stellarton, Nova Scotia. <laughs> Coming up on The Journal. Arms control, move and counter move, trade-off and concession, the deadly game of nuclear chess. Would it be acceptable if we had a protocol? We would agree with that uh, protocol. I think that we will be able to extend SALT to treaty. I find that acceptable at this point. I think that we have a deal. Surely. A bargain struck tonight on The Journal. Iran and Iraq are escalating their attacks on each other's cities. Iran apparently hit a building in downtown Baghdad with a ground-launched missile, and Iraq bombed Iran's capital, Tehran. The missiles hit close to the villa where the Ayatollah Khomeini lives. At least three people were killed in the attack on Tehran, and Iran says more than a thousand have died since Iraq started attacking cities and towns ten days ago. On the battlefront, Iraq claims its artillery and troops have pushed back an Iranian offensive near Basra. But Iran promises a much bigger offensive will soon be launched. It has about 300,000 troops massed near the border. The United States pulled some of its embassy staff out of Beirut this morning. They were taken by helicopter to Cyprus. Washington decided on the evacuation because of threats and the intense anti-American feeling in Beirut. As if to emphasize that, a British scientist was kidnapped in West Beirut this morning. And the British embassy says it's clear he was mistaken for an American. Thousands of illegal Central American refugees are trapped in the United States. They can't go back to their violence-wracked homelands, and they can't stay legally in the U.S. Now, more and more Salvadorans and Guatemalans are hearing about Canada. They're hearing that many are allowed in, and it's all completely legal. And there's even a group of friendly Americans ready to help them make that northern journey. Tonight, in the fourth part of our week-long special series, Sheila McVicker reports that some of Canada's newest refugees are coming by a very unusual route. Donya Maria has a lot on her mind. She still grieves for a husband who was assassinated in El Salvador. She's been left with two young children. Like the others at the Donna Mission in South Texas, she's made a big decision. She's decided to get even farther away from Central America. Rather than stay illegally in the United States or seek sanctuary in a church, she's going to go to Canada as a refugee. What most of these people know about Canada is on posters hanging on the mission wall. That and what these refugee workers can tell them. Toronto. In the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas, Ryan Karras and Richard Friesen are the connection to Canada. They're not the underground, they're the overground railway. They're part of a group called Jubilee Partners, and they have an informal arrangement with the Canadian government to find Salvadorans and Guatemalans living illegally in the U.S. who qualify for Canadian refugee status. We would place the greatest priority on those who have experienced the most direct danger and persecution, which caused them to flee their home countries those who are in the greatest danger of being deported back into those situations of persecution, and those who have made a, a logical, direct choice that they want to pursue their lives on a long-term basis in Canada. Unlike other church groups who help the illegals, Jubilee Partners work within the bounds of American law. I like to be legal, and... Um, I would like to do everything I can legally. Not doing anything illegal means using the law to obtain documents from the U.S. government, identity papers that allow the refugees to stay in the States temporarily until the Canadian visas arrive. So far, Washington has chosen to overlook their work. special church service is held about every three months, is to say goodbye to those Salvadorans who have the American papers and are heading off on the first stage of their journey north. 
they be on they don't go straight to Canada, at least not yet. Instead, there is a long drive to Jubilee's home base in Georgia. It looks like a summer camp. There are waving pines, quiet ponds, rustic buildings. But this is the center for a self-sufficient, self-described Christian community that specializes in helping refugees. Our chief motivation for doing the work that we're doing is because we are Christians who are very concerned about trying to put the, the teachings of, of Christ into action and responding compassionately to people that we see that are in real trouble. Do you have, what is your name? There is serious work done here to prepare the refugees for life in Canada. The thing that will make your body like a warm house are these extra pants that you wear underneath. They learn something about the rigors of winter, these people who can only imagine what snow is. Bueno. This is winter in Canada. Oh, I'll, I'll see. There are movies about their new home. The images are classically Canadian, if a little outdated. Some of the refugees are overwhelmed by the kindness and help they find here. Noe says he never expected to meet Americans like the people yeah. of Jubilee. They are doing something good. I never seen too many people can do that. The Canadian immigration officer in Atlanta believes in Jubilee too. He accepts his refugees, almost everyone Jubilee brings to Georgia. That's several hundred Salvadorans and Guatemalans every year. If I had to deal with uh, every individual, and not go through a pre-screening process using an organization like that or a referral agency. Uh, I'd need more staff, I'd need more money, I'd need, more, need to travel more. I'd spend an awful lot of time spinning my wheels and getting nowhere, quite frankly. The Overground Railroad to Canada has been so successful that Jubilee is considering expanding its program to helping European countries like Sweden and West Germany find Salvadoran and Guatemalans living illegally in the United States people who they feel also need a safe new home, and people for whom there might not be room enough in Canada. Still, Canada at least makes room for some, even for those the United States government wants to deport. Tomorrow night, different perspectives. Why Canada says yes, when the U.S. says no. Sheila McVicker, CBC News, Comer, Georgia. Farmers and grain companies in the West are debating an important proposal from the Canadian National Railway, one that some say could eventually destroy small town life on the prairies. The proposal is to cut the rate the CNR charges two companies to ship grain from their big inland terminals. Right now, the railway charges everyone the same rate, and some farmers and grain companies want to keep it that way. Christopher Walmsley reports. Grain elevators are the symbol of the Canadian prairies. They're the centerpiece of the community. Well, it always had an influence on a town. If there was no elevator, there didn't seem to be a town. Rod Roussel has farmed all his life near Asquith, Saskatchewan. He also helps out at his son's farm equipment dealership. He's not too happy about a proposal from CN Rail. CN and two grain companies want to offer farmers a weekend discount. If they haul their grain to the big inland terminals in Edmonton or North Battleford or this one in Saskatoon. The concern is that as more and more farmers deliver their grain to the big city terminals, these small rural elevators might disappear, and with them, the small towns that grew up around them. The grain companies involved in the proposal say that this count makes good business sense for farmers. By and large, uh, what we're talking about is moving grain to the marketplace as cheaply as we possibly can. Uh, hopefully, that will make our goods more competitive and allow us to uh, pay the farmer a, a better price. But CN has to get the better price approved by the Canadian Transport Commission. It's hearing arguments on both sides of the issue all this week in Saskatoon. Many farmers, like Rod Roussel, don't see the sense of trucking their grain all the way into the city, not when there's a perfectly good railroad right at the edge of town. And you see, your railroad is a steel bed, and they've stood up very well, and they're already here. Why throw something away that's good? and try to break something else up that you know isn't good. Later this spring, the Canadian Transport Commission will decide on the proposed discounts. They'll also decide on the future of prairie grain elevators and the small towns that depend on them. Christopher Walmsley, CBC News, Asquith, Saskatchewan.
Foreign leaders visiting Ottawa don't usually get the kind of reception that Israel's Foreign Minister Yitzhak Shamir received today. He met John Turner, the opposition leader, and Turner was obviously in a very friendly mood. Turner started things off by giving Shamir a touch of tactile politics. Then Turner showed Shamir a secret, an idea he thought Shamir might keep in mind next year when he takes over as Prime Minister of Israel from Shimon Peres. And I'll tell you, so, so we, you know, in those days, every, every, every Prime Minister has to have a secret door here. Look, <laughs> Come on, look. the secret door to escape. To escape nowhere. So when, uh, when, you, when, you, when you work your deal with Perez, get yourself a secret door. <laughs> Tomorrow, Shamir gets to meet Brian Mulroney. And that's The National for Thursday, March 14th. For CBC News, I'm Knowlton Nash. We'll have more news later. Now, The Journal. The Journal Arms Control Talks, Part 2. Strategic Weapons. Taking stock of the global nuclear arsenal. It was the United States that failed to ratify the SALTO agreement, as well as other arms control treaties. We reject categorically U.S. charges of Soviet cheating. The Soviet Union must reduce the number of its heavy ICBMs. This is essential. We cannot accept the indefinite expansion of the Soviet threat to the survivability of U.S. land-based systems. The Journal with Barbara Frum. Good evening. In our first edition on arms control, we addressed the nuclear weapon systems based in Europe. Tonight, our negotiators tackle what are designated strategic weapons, long-range warheads capable of striking the opposing country. Our negotiators, Dmitry Symes for the Soviet Union. Based now in Washington, born in the Soviet Union, he is the senior associate in Soviet foreign policy at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. For the United States, William Taylor, executive director of the Georgetown University Center for Strategic and International Studies. Throughout these programs, Ambassador Paul Warnke has been guiding us through this sometimes complicated world. He is the man who negotiated the SALT II Accords for the United States. He prepared this explanation of what is on the table in the strategic arms negotiations. The field of nuclear arms control has accumulated more than its share of acronyms, but the most notorious one is the doctrine of MAD, mutually assured destruction. Simply put, the doctrine of mutually assured destruction holds that neither side will launch a nuclear attack so long as it knows that the other side will be able to retaliate with an equally devastating nuclear blow. And that's what deterrence is all about. But not all nuclear weapons provide the same deterrent value. For example, these large land-based missiles and these strategic bombers are not by themselves the best deterrent because the missiles are in fixed silos that could be destroyed in a first strike. And the bombers take many hours to reach their targets. On the other hand, these submarines are a very good deterrent weapon. They are harder to detect and destroy at sea, and thus not vulnerable to a first strike. Now, clearly a key goal in arms talks is to reduce the overall number of nuclear weapons. But there is a growing debate over how we should count the weapons of each side. Ever since the SALT I Agreement of 1972, the currency of arms control, the unit of account, has been the number of launchers on either side. In effect, the number of land missile silos, submarine launching tubes, and bombers. Now that's what we're showing you here on this map. And we're using one model for every 40 actual launchers on each side. But back in the 1970s, both the Soviet Union and the United States develop what is known as MIRV technology, the ability to put more than one nuclear warhead on a single missile. Now, we've indicated multiple warhead weapons with the yellow cap. 
For example, all U.S. submarine-based missiles carry eight to ten warheads. And this giant Soviet missile, which we refer to as the SS-18, is equipped with up to ten warheads, and it's actually capable of carrying as many as 30. Now, this multiple warhead technology made arms control much more complicated. Now, warheads had to be counted, too. And this generated yet another complication in an important area of arms control, namely verification. Now, for years, photo reconnaissance satellites have made the task of counting nuclear launchers routine. It's been relatively simple to spot and count missile silos, bombers on runways, and submarines during construction, and also when entering and leaving their home bases. But counting warheads presents a new and tougher challenge. Satellites obviously cannot see under the cone of a missile, and that missile could have one, two, or ten warheads. Now these issues, how to count nuclear weapons and how to verify agreements, will be two of the toughest questions facing the two sides in Geneva. There have been only two major nuclear arms agreements, SALT I and SALT II. And neither one of them dealt fully with these questions. SALT I, which was signed in 1972, set some basic limits on total numbers of missile launches on either side. But it failed to deal with a multiple warhead problem. SALT II, which I helped negotiate on behalf of the United States, was signed in 1979, but was never ratified by the U.S. Senate. Still, both sides have voluntarily followed that treaty, which set limits on both the number of missile launches and the number of them with missiles that could carry multiple warheads. But in 1985, the situation is very different from what it was then. Both sides have developed powerful new weapons, such as the American MX missile and the B-1 bomber the Soviets' new ICBMs, and the cruise missiles that both are now deploying. Now, these negotiations on strategic weapons could be the most difficult because the issues are so complex. But at the same time, it is in the area of strategic weapons that the two sides have the most to gain by reaching a significant agreement. When we return, the negotiations begin. Something before dinner, sir. I'd like half a bottle of Golden. A half bottle, sir? Of Molson Golden. Howard, oh, I won't believe this, but there's some weirdo over there who wants a half bottle of Golden. <laughs> and this gentleman would like the other half. Sir, would you like the top half or the bottom half? You're smooth, son. Smooth as Golden. <laughs> You got everything for the big pitch in Pittsburgh, Pete? Yeah, I got it all, Paul. Got the slides? Yeah, I got the slides. You got the charts? Yeah, I got the charts. You got the audio? Yeah, I got the audio. You got the video? Yeah, I got the video. Don't forget the contracts. I won't forget the contracts. I forgot the contracts. You forgot the contracts. When you forget, remember Federal Express. They guarantee overnight delivery to the U.S. by 10.30 a.m. or you don't pay. You got the contracts? Yeah, I got the contracts. Herbicides are a major farm benefit and a major annual investment, so it pays to know the facts. When considering your herbicide needs, weigh the benefits of Hograss 2. One post-emergent application kills 21 broadleaf and grassy weeds in wheat, barley, and flax without tank mixing. Economical, consistent, and...